Welcome to 160th playthrough, and yes, we're up to the uh, to the big one for this year, Gettysburg. 160th, 160th play playthrough of uh, of Gettysburg. Now you may notice here this is <laughs> this is not the full battle. I did not set up for the full battle um, for this. Uh, way too big. Um, I've played it before in the original. Terrible Swift Sword, um, wonderful battle. I mean, if anybody has a chance to do that with uh, a few friends, uh, it's it's great, great battle. And it, this, uh, you know, in the new system as well, great battles of uh, the American Civil War, uh, it probably shines as well. I've just never played, you know, the full battle within there because I played the uh, the original Terrible Swift Sword. But that being said, uh, I do have three days of Gettysburg. Um, that's what I'm using here. It's the original version. I know there's a new version coming out. Can't wait to get get that. I know it's in development as we uh, as you watch here, and hopefully that will be out soon, sometime here in the next year or so. And uh, you know, I'd like to see that. And I know you know, in talking with a few of the, the developers on there, they are doing big scenarios like what we have in Great Battles already. But they're also doing some smaller scenarios as well, which is really good uh, when you don't have the big footprint to do it and you don't have you know four or five friends to to uh, play the big battles there as well. Um, it's it's good to be able to do some of the smaller stuff. But unfortunately, with three days of Gettysburg, uh, the version that's out right now, the scenarios save one are big. You know they're the they're either the full first day, uh, the second day. Um, or the third day, or all three days, which are just all three of them by themselves are massive in terms of uh, in terms of playing it uh, in there. There's one uh, Hair Ridge, which is it's an excellent scenario, which does the first day off there as well. But I decided for this to kind of go off a little bit uh, on the side, and actually a little talking with a friend of mine about this too. I, I kind of stumbled into a sub-genre of my genre that I'm playing with the 160th playthrough here as well. I'll explain that here in a little bit. But I've put together one here for the first day's battle. Uh, this is the day one battle. This is actually looking at the 11th, 11th Corps and the attack by early and doles against the 11th Corps over here. Um, that, that's always kind of fascinated me. The first day has always fascinated me um, for a couple of reasons. One, it's a meeting engagement. It's a pure meeting engagement um, between the two armies. Uh, they they kind of knew where everybody was, but it was still kind of a surprise and how it developed and everything. It was a pure uh, meeting engagement between the two uh, two armies. And, uh, you know, I've always been fascinated with with the First Corps, Buford, Heath, Pender, you know, uh, all of AP Hill's units that have come on there, and the attack over there on on uh, Cashtown Pike, and uh, just how that developed over there as well. But the other one that, and it, that gets a lot of press and, and good, of course, not as much as, say, the second and third day, of course, but still gets a good bit of press. But then, you know, there's also the other half of it, which kind of gets glossed over a bit in terms of, in terms of, uh, <laughs> I guess we'll call it sacrificing the 11th Corps, uh, meaning they've got overrun yet again uh, in most most uh, renditions of the uh, the battle, and uh, you know got pushed back, and you know that caused partially caused the retreat back through Gettysburg and you know, back up onto uh, Cemetery Hill there. But in terms of further reading on this, and I've been reading on this, you know, not just for up to this battle, but, you know, others, uh, other readings on this as well here and there. Um, there's a lot more to it, I found, uh, that's in there that I, I kind of wanted to explore in a battle, you know, fixed on this particular side of the, the battlefield. Um, because there was, there was mistakes, Purely, there was mistakes from from the uh, the senior officers for the 11th Corps um, at the time. There's there's things that they missed, things that they just didn't know, didn't have enough information on, and had to make very quick decisions upon what they had and kind of uh, cause their problems that they had uh, during that day. 
Um, and subsequently, you also had you know very strong veteran Confederate units uh, leading the attack on them in a perfect kind of flanking position uh, upon the 11th Corps. And it really developed into something that, that, that really crushed them and pushed them back. Although they didn't, they, they did rout, but they didn't really panic as, as many, many people believe. There, there was, you know, several that came through, particularly when they got to the town down here because they got lost in the town. Um, looks pretty much the same. It's all squares and things like that. And there was panic in there. But on the field itself, it was generally a hard fight for early and doles to press the Union. The fact that they that early had a good access of attack coming down the Harrisburg Road and had enough units in his division, crack units in division, that he could put a real spear point on the road and drive through the Union troops who were not as good a quality. Um, and by that, I mean they weren't trained, they weren't as veteran, uh, they were smaller units, um, you know, a lot of them had had still been fresh uh, and hadn't had a lot of, uh, haven't had a lot of experience. And some of their commanders did as well. So consequently, there was a lot of issues with just command. The, the regiments themselves were actually, you know, fairly decent. Um, the problem was, is just integrating that command and getting the right information to the senior commanders, particularly, um, where is he, Barlow and Schwartz here. Both of these, and actually Schwartz was the senior commander on the field, and, and Barlow, uh, Barlow gets a lot of a lot of press on there too, just because uh, of his advance and, of course, his his ultimate uh, near mortal wound, but he did recover. But again, they didn't have a lot of information. The way they deployed, they were deploying for a defense um, or to hold a defensive line for the attack from Oak Hill on the first corps over here. So consequently, a lot of them were looking in this direction, off to the northwest. Um, and you did have Barlow's units over here that did deploy uh, to cover the flank. That's what his, his job was over here. Um, but they really probably had the, the, the worst possible situation over here because you had some of the smallest units covering the, covering the flank, which, again, had this big spear point of Early's division coming right down upon it. So it's quite quite interesting there. They fought fairly well here uh, under the pressure and numbers that were that were there and having their flank turned. And uh, you know, I want to try to recreate this to kind of see what it's like, see how this fits in here. I have a feeling you know it's going to wind up in the same result. Uh, early is going to be down into Gettysburg here again, but I just wanted to get a flavor of what what really happened with the 11th Corps. You know. Is there different things, different decisions that we could make in here? And of course, I have to take that with a little bit of a little bit of a tinge because obviously we're looking at a bird's eye view of the whole situation. We don't have the information or lack of information that you know the field commanders had at the time. I try to simulate that here a little bit um, within the battle, uh, but hopefully, kind of see you know what type of decisions that that they both had to make. What type of decisions these all of these units had to make um, across here. Now I will one comment on here I will probably cut to pieces all of the German names um, on here. Uh, I will do my best with it. I've been practicing with uh, uh, some translations and but still I'm, I'm not good with names so I, I will try to try to be with that but I apologize um, at first with them if I mispronounce them as I go through the battles on here. So let me explain how I uh, pulled this together. Um, you're seeing the setup here, which is fairly historically accurate. Um, I used several maps that I've had. Um, I started with our good old uh, favorite ones here coming from the American Battlefield Trust. Oops, there we go. And uh, you know they, they gave me a good start, but I didn't feel it was complete. So looking back through several books, uh, several texts, uh, several um, period maps, 
that I have access to um, on here. I was able to adjust the units here a little bit, but I, the 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 battle, American Battlefield Trust was pretty good in terms of where I where I wanted to go. There was just a few things to to adjust on here. So all of this, my feeling, all this in comparison to all the maps that have been put together, as well as the text that I've read read on this, uh, my feeling is this is this is fairly fairly accurate. Um, so this is the setup here. We're we're actually just dealing with uh, Howard's division or Howard's corps, excuse me, with Barlow um, and Schwartz um, over here, and they're accompanying um, brigades. So you've got Ames here in reserve. You have uh, Langlisha up here, who is broken out into skirmish units. Now I'm using skirmish units from um, Death Valley to kind of form that skirmish units that were there at 2 p.m. That's another thing I should say. We're starting this around 2 p.m. on the first day. Uh, all around here was, was skirmishers, which I've broken out these skirmishers, have limited the mount, so I've kind of stretched these out over here. I've reduced units appropriately. Now, I know in the, the new version they're going to be going to be tuning, I guess I'll say, the uh, skirmishers a little bit. I don't know the details on that, but hopefully that will add a little bit more flavor to this because I feel this is this is good and it's going to do what I want to do for this this particular uh, series. Um, but there could be some some tweaking in there as well to uh, um, to help make it a little bit more flavorful. Uh, one of the things is particularly is the um, I think it's just the unit here. The uh, yeah 153rd PA uh, they actually dispatched four companies, which would essentially be four skirmishers, up to um, the the Benner, Benner House up here um, while Early was starting his advance up here. And that's not represented. Again, it was a small piece of it here, but it would be kind of interesting to be able to position, you know, four strength points up here initially um, as... You know, Gordon and Hayes are, are pushing back here to see what type of effect that's going to have. Because obviously, they're not going to stay there. They're going to fall back. They may fire a few rounds and, and fall back. But, you know, can that hold up that a little bit to provide a little bit more relief to uh, the other units? Um, the other units, excuse me, I, sp I misspoke on that. It wasn't the, 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 the uh, 153rd. It was actually... The 17th Connecticut, here it is down here. They actually provided the units up here. The, the, the 153rd did put out skirmishers. That's what this unit is down here representing. But it was actually the, the 17th Connecticut. So I stand my, I corrected myself. So before anybody corrects it for me, I corrected myself. So anyway, this is the union, union setup over here. Um, the command structure, the way I have it, I do have Howard here, and I think you can see him just off the board. Let me just check here. Yeah, you can see him. He's sitting right in the middle of Gettysburg Square. Now, special rule on him, he can't move until the Confederates get into the town. Um, this is representing where Howard was. Howard was technically you know, off map. He was down uh, on Cemetery um, Ridge. He was also in town a little bit, uh, up on the roofs, kind of surveying things and trying to figure out what was going on as this was developing. So to kind of represent this, but he was, and he was still in command. He did dispatch uh, Schwartz up here to handle the north, the northern field, but he still had runners going out to uh, going out to them to um, to figure out what was going on, as well as going over to the first corps to figure out what was going on there as well. So I. I did want to have him represented just to help restrict the command within the Union Army uh, because we'll still have to stay in command of Howard, which means keeping within his um, command range. And of course, most of this will be on the roads uh, for this to occur. And, uh, you know, I think that will help in terms of the AMs that are drawn and, or not drawn. And, uh, yeah, see how that goes there as well. So Howard will be here. Can't move till the Confederates come into town. Then he can move. But by that point, if the Confederates are in the town, pretty much uh, probably have won the won the game here as well. Everything else is still the same. We'll have uh, divisional commands here with Barlow and Schwartz. 
we'll have our, our platoons and course of regiments um, across there. There's a little bit of Union artillery here, here, and up here. Um, Wilkerson's guns up here uh, to uh, try to defend there as well. From the Confederate perspective, perspective, we have Early, as I mentioned before. I've got him set up with Gordon uh, initially. This is, as I said, about 2 p.m. when uh, they were advancing. I have Hayes and Avery just off board. They'll be coming in on this first turn. Uh, and I did that for a couple of reasons. One, I didn't want to clog things up over here because you can see I've got Early. And then I, there's artillery over here on the hill, um, which I just noticed I've got to uh, adjust over here uh, because one of these batteries, I'll, I'll have to figure it out, one of these batteries actually needs to go um, kind of in reserve uh, as part of the uh, advance. But we've got the batteries up here. They can be able to fire across here. That should be prove interesting as well. But Hayes and Avery will move up. Um, Hayes, no doubt, will probably come along here. I'll have Avery come along here. I'm trying to stick historically to the advance of what Early had done. Um, I know I can say, oh boy, I could swing them way around the flank and come down the York Pike. Uh, but I, I don't want to do that. Again, this is a study of the uh, the attack here, the, the attack on the first day, trying to keep to the same jumping off points. And really the study is going to be how the units react and how and what decisions need to be made as part of the attack. So we'll say historic as much as we can uh, within there. Uh, with that said, the victory conditions um, basically are going to be points. Whoever has the most points obviously wins. Points are going to be derived the same ways. Uh, each brigade that is combat ineffective, uh, five points. Division, uh, oops, brigade, division. Uh, each division that is combat ineffective, another five points. Um, Artillery, you know, one strength, one point for each strength point. Uh, we have no cavalry, so that won't count there as well. And then we also have uh, victory hex locations. We've got Barlow's Knoll, or Bar not Barlow's, but eventually it would be Barlow's Knoll. But Blotcher's Knoll is going to be one point for all, controlling all three of those hexes. So they've got to control all three of them to get that point. And again, that will be avoided awarded at the end of the game, not during the game itself. Um, it'll be end of the game because it's going to be short. We're going to have one point down here for the Adams County Alms House. Um, and when that's taken uh, by either side or held by either side, we've got one point for the brick kiln down here. We've got two points for the college. Uh, Penn College over here. Uh, I did two points over here because if the Confederates get over here, they've really, you know, kind of wiped out. Union is probably in the town by this point and in, in full retreat. So, you know, trying to hold this off so that it would potentially cover some sort of retreat of the first corps down here. And then the big one under Howard here, the town square, that's going to be worth a whopping five points at the end of the game there as well. So um, that's what it is. Again, the differentials uh, between the two will decide what level of victory for either side. Um, other things to note here, looking at my special rules, we're using the skirmishers, as I said, from from um, from Death Valley. Uh, I'll use the Death Valley rules as is. So you know how the skirmishers are used within there is uh, is going to be it. Uh, in terms of the commanders, uh, Howard and Early are the, well, I'll call tactical commanders uh, controlling this. It really should be, you know, Schwartz up here, but it's going to be them. So in terms of uh, efficiencies, Howard will draw efficiencies. It'll be uh, one, three, two twos, and a one uh, for them to see what the efficiencies are going to be for uh, Howard. Uh, early, it might early, because I did kind of game this out here a little bit, kind of walking it through. My early um, gaming on this, I did have early picking efficiencies, but then I said, it's actually going to be better. He was he was on a mission. They just slammed into him and, and kept going as much as possible. So early and all together, um, they will always have 4 a.m.s for turn. 
Okay, um, so they'll be able to move as much as they want. Of course, fatigue will be there. Fatigue is not optional. So we will be doing fatigue. So that'll add a little bit of variability in terms of what what's what to do with his uh, with the, with his AMs. Okay, um, Dole himself is is technically out of command um, over here. So he will have to. Um, roll for brigade change orders. Um, he's a plus two, so he should be able to should be able to do pretty well uh, in here to get the attack going. But I left him like that just just to see you know if there's a little hesitation or anything in there, or so a little bit of variability. Now the one thing I did add to this is if if Dole moves down and gets in command range of early, he can now be activated. Um, in a, uh, um, what you call it? Oh boy, I forget now. Um, yeah, activate part of brigades. If you want, if, if early wanted to try to activate, you know, two, three brigades, Dole can be now part of that, um, within there. So that will give the ability for them to, um, activate, uh, Dole together with Gordon and maybe, um, Hayes or Avery on a big assault at some point. So I put, I put that in there on that. Uh, let's see, other notes here. Confederates. Hayes and Avery will come in, as I said, to uh, 2 p.m. turn and should be able to deploy pretty quickly after that. You see the setup over here. Um, told you about Howard and his command structure over here and their AMs. Um, oh, another thing, the Union, uh, the skirmishers themselves, uh, even though I just told you about... Um, the 17th moving up to um, Brenner here. I've put in effect that, you know, they can't move across here. I've, that, those four companies eventually fell back over there. And as I said, if there's different skirmish rules, I might do this differently, but I'm just keeping it simple here. So bottom line here is that the Union units can't advance across Rock Creek over here. They will effectively in um, defensive position over here. That includes the skirmishers as well. Um, and then you see the setup for the Union. I talked about that. Oh, Union also gets some reinforcements. Uh, you can't see them. They're just off map, so I'll just move them up here. Coster and the uh, the uh, K battery of uh, Ohio 1st will come on along with the 154th, 134th New York, and 27th Pennsylvania in turn four, uh, or 4 p.m. turn, I should say. And they will come through the town at that point. This will actually help simulate uh, a little bit of a defensive, final defensive stand here in the town around the kiln and into uh, into um, town of Gettysburg there to cover cover the retreat. So we'll see how that works out. So they'll have a little bit of reinforcements. Told you about the victory conditions. Um, oh, turns, yeah. So this starts at 2 p.m. It's going to end with full play through of um, the 5 p.m. turn. So we're going to have two, three, four, and five. So it's going to be four turns. All right, so that's another thing that's going to you want early moving quickly because he's only got four turns to get down there, and he's got to do some fighting to get there. So... Um, you know, he needs to have as much AMs as possible to move down there. And he probably will incur fatigue, or I should say the brigades will incur fatigue um, as things get get going here. But again, that'll be a management point. That'll be a decision point as to how we want to manage um, that attack. Because I think, I think we'll find that even though these guys got run over historically, I think they'll put up a bigger fight um, than most of the stories we here have, and I'm hopeful that may occur over here. Again, I'm not trying to drive which way it goes. I'm going to let the dice and uh, decisions uh, do that, but um, I'm hopeful to get that. I'll be happy if it does, because then I'll feel it's a success. So even if early just wipes them out and drives straight down Harrisburg Road and lines up in the town square, great. But those decisions of how he did that and how um, the 11th Corps responded is going to be the key thing that I'm that I'm looking for here. So that's going to be my playthrough um, for the 160th of Gettysburg. 
Uh, not a real big one. Uh, I'm not doing the popular stuff, you know, the the pickets charge or um, round tops, uh, double stand, or anything like that. I would I would like to do that potentially with this or other series um, with that, but for the sake of time and um, effort here, uh, I'm just doing something like this, very simple, and hopefully it'll also get me uh, that command structure here, uh, understanding that command structure and how things are going here as well. One other point I mentioned before, I said I've got a sub-genre sub going, and somebody pointed this out to me, actually, a friend of mine pointed this out to me watching my videos, that uh, he said, oh, it seems like you're really concentrating on the second core for these for these past few videos. And then I kind of looked back and I said, well, yeah, kind of. I, you know, last one I did was second Winchester, which is a prelude to this, uh, which we had early. We didn't have Doles, but we had early, and we had a Hayes. Um, we had Johnson over there as well. And uh, uh, then before that, of course, Chancellorsville, and of course that was all the second core attacking. Uh, early wasn't there, uh, but we did have Hayes, uh, we did have Doles, we did have um, uh, some of Johnson's units that were reorganized there as well. So I kind of have a sub-genre sub <laughs> going through here, and I asked myself, boy, why is that? And I said, ah, you know why? Because really the second core under Jackson or you know, afterwards under Yule still was kind of the kind of Lee's hammer in battle. They had most of the veteran troops. They had done a lot of a lot of hard fighting, a lot of hard um, battling. So we're kind of you know seeing that here as well, uh, just because you know of who they who they were and how they were organized um, in here as well. So we're kind of looking at the the Confederate Second Corps here, and also too I was thinking about it, we've got the Eleventh Corps going back to Chancellorsville that we're showcasing here as well. Um, they kind of match up here uh, again. Uh, this will probably be the last meeting for them because we know historically that um, you know after the 11th Corps was, was beat up here, um, they kind of recuperated like the, the, both armies did, uh, but then they were shipped off um, in late October um, to the west to uh, counter um, Longstreet's move out there and to um, help support the Army of the Cumberland and uh, help with Chattanooga and such. So, um, so yeah, this will be interesting. Um, we'll see how this goes for a battle and hope you enjoy this as much as I have, um, again, with the decisions and decision-making and seeing how history plays out um, and if we if we do it the same, we do it different, or we see different anomalies in here um, that we pick up in our readings, because uh, it's always interesting, because it always, my feeling is it always helps making decisions here um, with this type of situation, helps you to make decisions in the real world that you may be facing, uh, that you need to think through and figure out. So, anyways, that's my introduction to this. Um, so I'll be doing... Probably one turn uh, per video. I may double them up here. I, I haven't quite figured that out yet because I really haven't got playing yet. Um, we'll see how long they go, and I may be doubling them up and get them in the 20 to 30 minute mark. And uh, stay tuned for those. So thanks for watching. Um, we'll see you on the first turn. <laughs>